thank you for joining us today. I'm Mackenzie Paul. And I'm Kristen Acosta. Today we will be discussing the winners of the Oscars as well as the fashion displayed on the red carpet. But not before giving you the latest news on the measles. And joining us in studio is a member of the ASCLUG Programs Board. It's all coming up right here on CLU News. <laughs> The outbreak of the measles has been an ongoing discussion, but is it still posing a threat? And if so, what can you do to protect yourself from it? Here's Abby Walder with the latest statistics on the outbreak. Two more cases of measles have been reported in Ventura County, making a total of 10 cases of measles since February 12. Even though there has been a lot of hoopla about measles, many people do not know the effects of the virus and what it can do. I know it's a disease. It's a virus. Yes, a virus. There you go. The was extinct and it's now coming back to the United States. You don't want them. I have no idea why I did. <laughs> <laughs> I know that it didn't let me go to Disneyland. Um, you get stuff all over your body that you don't want. The funk. Yeah, I believe it was a, a small wooden ship using uh, war times. So here's a quick breakdown of what you need to know. Measles was declared eliminated in 2000, but in December, it is suspected that a foreign visitor to California's Disneyland carried the airborne virus where it spread to the other guests in the park. The virus is highly contagious and can linger in the air for up to two hours and spread up to 100 feet from the carrier and is spread by coughing, sneezing, or even just breathing. Effects include hot sweats, diarrhea, and an uncontrollable urge to scratch. More serious effects include pneumonia and encephalitis, which is a disease that can lead to irreversible brain damage. Health officials suggest that the best way to prevent infection is to receive vaccinations, which luckily many people received when they were children. That's our measly recap on the virus. I'm Abby Walder. Back to you in the studio. Turning to positive news, the 87th Oscars took place this past weekend. The glamorous award show was hosted by the beloved Neil Patrick Harris and included performances from Lady Gaga, Maroon 5, and Tim McGraw, to name a few. Kaylee has the complete story. Thanks guys. I'm Morgan McVay with CLU Live, reporting from the Spine at California Lutheran University. The 87th Annual Academy Awards will be held this Sunday, February 22nd at the Dolby Theater in Hollywood, California. This year, the Oscars will be hosted by Neil Patrick Harris, who as you all know is no rookie to hosting the show. We thought we'd come to CLU and ask some of the students who they thought would take home their very own golden statues. So now we're here with Z, a sophomore who is also a TV and film major at CLU. So Z, who do you think will win for Best Picture? Well, um, I think that it's going to be American Sniper. Um, I'm not sure. It's either that or Boyhood. Um, I think Boyhood is a little more likely to win, although I would like American Sniper. Um, or Selma, but I'm not really sure because I know it's not, directed f uh, it's not nominated for Best Director. But hopefully it's American Sniper just because it was a really moving uh, right. movie. Good choice, good choice. <laughs> I'm here with sophomore Karina Hernandez, who is going to tell us who she thinks is going to win for Best Actress. So Karina, who do you think is going to win? So I think it's probably going to be Patricia Arquette from Boyhood, but I would like for it to be Felicity Jones from The Theory of Everything, because she's really beautiful and talented, and um, yeah, that's what I think is going to happen. We're here with Ryan, who's a TV and film major, who's going to tell us who th he thinks is going to win for Best Actor. So Ryan, who do you think is going to win? I have a feeling it's going to be Bradley Cooper for uh, American Sniper. Definitely. Good choice, good choice. <laughs> We're here with freshman Kayla Francisco from Canada, who's going to tell us who she thinks is going to win for Best Picture. So Kayla, who do you think is going to win? I think Bradley Cooper for American Sniper, but I, it probably won't win just because it seems that the Academy is very against war in all aspects. So unfortunately, I don't think it'll win. So it'll probably be the theory of everything with Eddie Redmayne. It was a great movie. A. Yes. A. So we're here with Emma, who's a sophomore here at CLU, and she's going to tell us who she thinks is going to win for Best Actor. So Emma, who do you think is going to win? Uh, my, go my vote goes for Bradley Cooper uh, in American Sniper. The highly anticipated Academy Awards will take place this Sunday, February 22nd at 5.30 and will be hosted by Neil Patrick Harris. Films such as American Sniper, Birdman, Boyhood, The Grand Budapest Hotel, The Imitation Game, Selma, The Theory of Everything, and Whiplash are nominated for Best Picture. Incredible actors and actresses such as Benedict Cumberbatch, Michael Keaton, Felicity Jones, and Reese Witherspoon, just to name a few, are nominated for Best Actor and Best Actress in a Leading Role. 
as well as three other nominees in each category. Host Neil Patrick Harris is quite familiar to the Oscar stage. Harris opened up the show in 2010 for Steve Martin and Alex Baldwin with a terrific number entitled, No One Wants to Do It Alone. With some big shoes to fill after Ellen DeGeneres' record-breaking number of retweets of a photo ever to be posted on Twitter, can Harris top this infamous Twitter-breaking selfie in this weekend's show? Well, it looks like American Sniper is a CLU favorite. To see if your prediction was right, tune in to ABC7 this Sunday. I'm Morgan McVeigh, and back to you in the studio. Lots of talent was rewarded at the Oscars, but recognized talent isn't the only reason millions of viewers tuned in Sunday night. Celebrities donned breathtaking outfits and posed for the cameras. Ashley has all the details on the glitz and glamour. This year's Oscar show was boring and predictable. Fortunately, the red carpet was anything but. Reese Weatherspoon looked elegant in her Tom Ford gown. She kept it classic, not wild. I really liked Reese because I felt like she had just gone for this like classy look and I really liked her makeup and her hair and everything. And then I just loved Margot Robbie's whole look. It was really simple and elegant, but um, she really looked like a movie star and I think that's the most important thing at the Oscars. Emma Stone was not only a winner for Birdman winning Best Picture, but she looked amazing in her Ellie Saab hot couture gown, which was custom made for her. Lady Gaga wore custom white, Aliyah dress, and Lorraine Schwartz jewels. She wore gloves on the red carpet. I'm not sure if this was part of her Sound of Music tribute. But Lady Gaga's dress was really extravagant, being just a white pearl dress and then just giant red gloves. I thought she was like a plumber. Rosamund Pike was dressed to kill in her Givenchy hot couture number. It was nice seeing her in this beautiful red dress. Dakota Johnson was anything but Fifty Shades of Lame in her beautiful Saint Laurent gown and Forever Mark jewels. Worst dress was probably Nicole Kidman. Um, I also wasn't too big of a fan of Lupita Nyong'o's dress. I wish that um, it wasn't all pearls, maybe just part of the dress. I think it was really just too much, especially considering the fact that she wasn't even nominated this year. Getting part of the red carpet was all about fashion and getting the pictures and seeing what everyone was wearing. Pretty much the middle part, um, if you were hard news, you were mostly talking about the actors and what they had to do go through to get to the Oscars, and then as slowly as you went back, it turned the corner to go into the Dolby Theater was more of the highlights of what everyone was doing. The four acting winners for the night were J.K. Simmons, Patricia Arquette, Julianne Moore, and Eddie Redmayne, and Best Picture went to Birdman. I'm Ashley Kurtz, and now back to you guys. Thanks, Ashley. It seems like every year the actors are up their game. Indeed. I don't know how they can top the season. Our very own Ryder Christ was a PA at the Oscars, so of course he got to see the fashion up close and personal. But today, he's presenting on a returning item that's popping up on a French restaurant menu, foie gras. Hey CLU, plan on going to a fancy restaurant this weekend? You might want to try this. Foie gras hit the menu in a lot of California French restaurants Valentine's Day weekend, but before you order it, you should probably know what it is and what the controversy is all about. Where, what is foie gras? Foie, foie gras, it's duck or goose liver. It's for cruelty of animals. That's what happened when you overfeed with corn, the duck or the goose, the liver get bigger. It gets more fat to it. Now California allow us to eat, allow us to eat what we want. They don't put restriction on our food, which is, I think, it's the right way of doing it. The dish was banned in California in 2012, but back in February, a federal judge struck down the law, and now it's selling like crazy. We serve the duck foie gras. It's a fresh foie gras slice with saute with a raspberry sauce and grilled asparagus. We uh, start doing it um, just right after the the new law passed and we've been selling like crazy. High demand from young kids for adults. People love the delicacy. Foie gras was a big seller for Valentine's Day weekend and Chef Michelle has assured me that new combinations of the plate will be ready in spring. I'm Ryder Christ, back to you in the studio. Despite the ways that foie gras is prepared, it is considered a delicacy in different countries around the world. Continuing with controversial topics, CLU's theater department is putting on a play that's centered around same, a same-sex couple. Veronica has the full story. This is Veronica Pack here at Overton Hall with Kevlin Holmes here to talk about Stop Kiss. Hi, my name is Kevlin Holmes and I'm a junior here at CLU. Stop Kiss will start on February 25th and the last day to watch is on March 1st at 2 p.m. It will be performed in the Black Box in Theater Arts Building. $10 general admission, 
and will be free for CLU students. So Stop Kiss is about two women in New York, Sarah and Callie, and their relationships with each other. Um, there's a little bit of feelings that go around and the play centers around them discovering those feelings and then a hate crime that happens as well. I play Sarah and she is sort of a country girl from St. Louis. She's lived there her entire life with her parents and she decides out of the blue to accept this teaching job in the Bronx, New York. And it's about her really coming out of her shell and trying to be an individual. College is a time for change and it's where, you know, I really want to step out of my comfort zone and so I definitely interpreted Sarah as being that kind of next step in my life. I'm not going to be at Kalu all the time. I'm going to have to move somewhere completely different and meet new people and be a stranger in a new city or country or wherever I end up. So it's definitely it. I want to say thank you to Kevin Holmes for the interview and back to you guys in the studio. Thanks, Veronica, for that insightful information. Sounds like Stop Kiss contains a lot of talent. CLU's talent only continues to be shown through its athletics. In the next week or so, student athletes will be informed of official NCAA qualifying times for the Division III National Championships, taking place in Texas from March 18th to the 21st. Hi, I'm Mick Privatelli here with Ryan Perez, CLU Athlete of the Week and current record holder for the men's 3K. Ryan Perez, who is a junior student athlete, has played a key role in both men's cross country and track and field, despite the fact that he did not join the team until his sophomore year. In his most recent race, he exceeded both the team's and his own expectations by getting a PR. We look forward to hearing more news from Ryan's success. So Ryan, uh, tell us, what was your time for the 3K? Uh, my time was my personal best. Uh, I ran at 8.54 in the 3,000 meters this past week. Okay. And uh, for those of us at home who don't know the exact distance of the 3,000 meter, how, about how far is that? It's about it's close to two miles. It's seven and a half laps on the track, which is oh. just 200 meters short of two miles. Okay. So. Um, could you describe to us how you felt during the race? Um, I came into the race not expecting to do as well as I did. The conditions were pretty bad. It was rainy and windy. Um, so I didn't expect much out of it, and then as I was racing, I felt good, and I realized this could be the race where I set my best time. That's a great person, personal best, yeah. So, were, did you do any strategizing <coughs> or envisioning before the race? Um, I just <clears throat> planned on staying with our teammate, my teammate, uh, Garrett Baker. Okay. I planned on just staying behind him as long as possible, and then holding on and seeing where I could go from there. That's right. my plan. Excellent. And uh, is there anything else you'd like to add for us? Um, I'm just stoked to be here. I'm really honored to be a part of this team and this program at the CLU Athletics. It's a great group of guys to be around and I'm really enjoying competing right now. Excellent. Hi, I'm Nick Privatelli here with Allie Hadley, the current school record holder, the women's javelin throw, and the winner of the Westmont Sunshine Open Meet. So, Ali, uh, what was the distance of your throw? Uh, it was 48 meters, and um, so to make that you know more relatable to you guys, it's probably uh, around 157 feet. Okay. So. All right. Wow. Well. Um, could you explain to us what the rules are of the javelin throw? Um, well, the general rules are just um, like every, it's kind of the same as the other throwing events, you get three throws and then um, if you're top, one of those three throws is in the top out of the group of girls throwing, then you get to qualify for finals, then you get three more throws. All right. So, um, yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so what would you say you attribute your success to? Um, well, definitely it was a big shock, obviously having the PR and the school record happen so early in the season, so uh, I would say my success definitely went to a lot of the hard work in the off season. Um, this last fall, uh, me and my coach, Justin Puccinelli, definitely uh, pushed it really hard uh, just so I'd uh, come out ready for the season, and um, definitely coming off of last year, there was a lot of motivation after not uh, attain what I what I wanted to in the end so uh, that was also a lot of motivation that pushed me in the offseason to uh, push a little bit harder and yeah well good luck with the rest of your season Ellie I'm Mick Privatelli back to you in the studio
And even though the weather says otherwise, spring sports are underway. The men's tennis team includes talent from numerous locations worldwide, representing six different countries. Here's Allie with an update on how the diverse team is doing. I'm here at the Polson Tennis Center, where the CLU Kings men faced off against Pomona Pitzer. We talked with head coach Mike Gannett to talk more about this season. The Kingsman tennis team opened up Skyak with an 8-1 to one team loss against the Pomona Pitzer Sage Hens. Um, I prepared for this match. I mean, we played a lot of practice sets and we did a lot of conditioning prior to this match. So um, I've just been getting a lot more match tough. But I mean, I haven't really played that much in the last couple of years. So it's still kind of progressively been getting better for me. But I don't feel like my 100% yet. So I'm, I'm confident that in the next couple of weeks after a little bit more conditioning and match play and whatnot, that when the... Um, all of the matches start to commence that I will be ready to go. Despite the loss, Moises Cardenas was strong in his number one singles match with a score of 6-3, to 6-3. to three. Gio Valdez played a close match at number four singles where he played to a tiebreaker in the second set, falling 10-7 to seven to lose by 6-2. to two. I think for this season that everybody sets goals and works towards improving their game and getting as good as they can. We're not really sure how good we are yet. Uh, it's a strong team, but as far as how we end up with our rankings, we're not really sure yet. I mean, this team, you know, they're, it's a top 10 team, and we're definitely, you know, outclassed today. Uh, we, we beat Brandeis uh, the other day, who's 31 in the nation, and it was a close match. But, but we fought and showed a lot of character, and that was a lot of fun. But, you know, our, our ranking of 20 might be about where we're, we're at right now. This is Alessandria Posada. Back to you in the studio. Of course, we wish the men's tennis team, as well as the rest of spring sports, best of luck during the upcoming season. And speaking of luck, the next student profile candidate seems to be earning his fair share of victories on and off the field. Sophomore Cody Jones wears many hats on campus and serves as an admirable leader to many. Heather has the complete story. Sophomore Kingsman Cody Jones is a second year track and field team member who participates in the javelin competition. He is currently on his way to the National Paralympic team competing in Rio de Janeiro in the summer of 2016. Recently, I caught up with Jones and we discussed his current adventures. So originally I was introduced to the Paralympics um, from my baseball coach. Uh, he got an email from Kathy who is the head of the track and field uh, like department, I don't know what to call it, for, uh, for the, the US, uh, the Paralympic Committee or whatever for the United States. I don't know her official title, but anyway, so she emailed my baseball coach in high school, and I started throwing discus. So I was originally out here for discus my freshman year, and then I saw Justin and Allie and Bjorn throwing javelin, and they looked like they were having a good time, and so I did that. Jones is a registered member of the International Paralympic Committee, or the IPC. Yeah, for about a year, uh, ever since I came to Kalu, in order to, to really throw for the Paralympics, you have to register to, uh, with the IPC. He is working his way to the national team. Yeah, so once you get your IPC licensing, uh, which which what you just asked me, um, you you just throw up meets that are qualified, and if I throw a certain distance, then I get to be on the national team, hopefully. Oh, cool. Yeah, so I'm, I'm hoping for a national A-team standard this year, 47 meters. Um, I'm about eight or so off right now, but I haven't thrown in many meets this year, so I'll be closer for sure. Cal Lutheran alumni Justin Puccinelli is Jones's throwing coach. I have been working with Cody for just about a year now. Puccinelli enjoys coaching Jones because he is extremely driven. Like he really works hard. He he uh, he he wants to be better, and he's you know he's super humble about what he's done, and you know he he's not complacent about where he is. He always wants to get better. I have the America's record, which is really cool. Um, Working on the world record, so 12 meters away from that, uh, it's exciting. So next step is nationals, then world championships. This has been your sports update. We're throwing the javelin back to you in the studio. It seems that there's nothing that Cody Jones can't do. What a great story he has. Here with us now in the studio is another hardworking member of the CLU community, Carlos Moran, ASCLUG Programs Board Representative. Hello, Carlos. It's a pleasure to have you. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Now, Carlos, we have to ask, will there be a spring formal this year? Yes, May 2nd. Uh, the, pro the board's currently in the process of planning the event, but it's going to be on that date. So save it if you guys are listening. 
What other events does Programs Board coordinate? Right, so for the month of March, we're going to have Mr. Kingsman for, on the it's going to be Friday the 13th. And we are also having uh, go-kart racing March 21st. And the board's working really hard to plan the event currently. Sounds like you guys are busy. Can you tell us more about your experience? Right, so I j I've been representing Program Sport for the past four years. I joined without actually knowing what it was. Uh, some people actually, you know, Carlos, you have a great personality. I want you guys, to, you know, I want you to join. And so I did, and I l loved it. I um, really got to learn about myself. You know, you get to work a lot with different people. You plan events, you manage how to really your stress levels, right? And it's just a great experience and it's fun and I couldn't imagine myself not doing it throughout my college career. It's clear that the programs board really focuses on student need. Definitely. Thank you for coming in, Carls. We really appreciate it. Thank you. If you are interested in applying for a position on the 2015-2016 <coughs> programs board, fill out an application on calutheran.edu slash ASCLUG. And that concludes our show. We'd like to thank those of you who made this new segment possible, and of course, you, the viewers. I'm Mackenzie Paul. And I'm Kristen Acosta. Have a wonderful day, and thank you for watching CLU News. Mm -hmm.